We turn now to our first of four scriptures and meditations of Jesus on that first Palm Sunday, according to the Gospel of Luke. Hear now God's word to us. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there I was, munching on my hay, minding my own business, when all of a sudden these two strangers came from nowhere and started untying my rope from the post. I tried to scream, help, help, I'm being stolen, but nobody understood donkey language in Aramaic. Finally, my owners came out just as they were finished untying me, and my owners asked these two strangers, why are you untying the colt? And these two strangers said, the Lord needs it. Well, the Lord? What Lord? What, the Lord of what? And the, the Lord needs me? For, for what reason? But you know, my owners never asked any more questions. They just let me go off with these two strangers. After raising me from a newborn, how could they? Didn't I mean anything to them? But no, nope, these two strangers just took me off. Well, I was pretty upset at first, but then I thought, you know, these seem like pretty nice people, and maybe this is my chance to see the world. So they took me to the Mount of Olives, and there was already a huge crowd there. They were all very joyous and happy. I thought maybe it was some kind of a, a parade or a party or something. Well, they, they set me there, and they put these cloaks on me, and then... I saw this man, this special man. He, he was sad but joyful. He was compassionate and yet very determined, driven. And they, they set him on my back. Now, I, I'd never had anyone ride me before. I don't know what it's supposed to feel like, but you know, he wasn't heavy at all. It, it wasn't a burden to carry him. Now, not everybody was happy. There were some people there that were telling him to stop the procession and stop doing this, but much to their dismay, the crowd just kind of kept growing larger and larger, and they, they started having these branches that they were waving and, and the cloaks that were set along the road that I could tread on. They were sat shouting, blessed is the king. And I thought, you know, this is the Lord that these two strangers were talking about. This is the Lord that needs me. 
This is a, a king. And you know, I kind of stood a little taller that day. I kind of felt like a, a white steed, knowing that I had someone as important as a lord and a king that I was carrying. And you know, in some way, I felt like I was a, a small part of a larger plan that day. I felt important. And I started thinking, you know, if this lord or this king kind of had a part for me to play in this, in this bigger plan in life, maybe he also has a, a plan for all creatures, especially you human creatures. And I started to think about my owners. What if my owners had asked 20 more questions? Where are you going, and when will you bring it back, and what are you going to do with the cold, and why do you need it in the first place, and who is the Lord, and the Lord of what? Or what if my owners had never let me leave in the first place? I never would have been a part of that, that bigger procession, that bigger plan. I mean, what if you were my owner? Would you have let some strangers just take me off? with no further questions asked? Or what if the Lord asked for your time and your talent and your treasure? Would you surrender that to the Lord with no more questions asked? You see, I think there's some kind of plan that we're all a part of, but somehow God allows us to choose whether or not we want to be a part of that. So what if this Lord asks to surrender your skills, your time, your resources, your donkeys? Are you willing? Are you able to give to the Lord? Because you see, it all starts from the king who asks a royal request. And somehow it's up to us whether or not we participate, whether or not we want to surrender all that the Lord asks of us. We turn to our second scripture reading and an event that three of the four Gospels have happening during this Holy Week time. Here now, Mark's version of Jesus in the temple. Hear God's word to us. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I work at the Jerusalem temple. You see, in Jerusalem, we have a lot of pilgrims that come from all over the world, really, especially at Passover time, to come and to worship. Well, because we have all these foreigners, they don't always have the right coins to get in. You, you may not know this, but um, you see, we have a temple tax that is charged in order to get into the temple. The thing is, it's 12 denarii. Well, some people don't have that currency, and so... I help people 
get into the temple. You see, they come and they bring all their foreign money and their coins, and I exchange it for the denarii they need to get into the temple. Without it, they couldn't. Well, this one um, particular day that I was working, there were a lot of people there because it was Passover after all, and the, the line was a mile long as far as people that wanted to exchange their coins. And, um, well, at one point, there was this, I don't know, this lunatic of a guy that comes ranting and raving in the temple of all places. And he comes and, and he disturbs all the sacrificial animals that are there. In fact, my best friend is the, uh, the dove merchant. And this guy even, like, let out some of the doves and the inventory flew away. Well, he was... He was screaming that, that uh, something about like a den of robbers and, and a house of prayer. I mean, I didn't catch it all. I was just in shock that someone would act this way in the temple, for goodness sakes. I, I must have been in shock because before I knew it, this, this guy was standing right in front of me. And he had that like fire in his eyes. He was angry. And all I can think is, what have I ever done to you? I mean, I've never even met this guy. But he looks at me, and, and he puts his hands on my table with all the meticulously stacked coins that I had in my organizational, and he takes it and he turns it over. And the table crashes on the floor, and, and the coins, you can hear the, the clinging of the coins spread all over the floor. I had no idea what this guy was capable of, to tell you the truth. I mean, I thought he might try to hurt me or something. He, he looked that angry, and so I took off. I ran. I, I heard that later on he also did that with, with the other money changers and other tables that were there, but I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I was afraid for my life. I mean, I just, I've never experienced anything like this before. Well, by the time I came back, wouldn't you know, all my money had been stolen by other people. I lost a full day's work that day. But I was able to regroup, and, you know, in a day or two, I was exchanging money again, just, just like always. It was Passover, after all. But I couldn't get that day out of my mind. What would cause someone to be so angry, to be such a disruption? in the temple, the holy place where we go and worship God. I mean, I'm helping people try to get into the temple to worship. The people that sell the animals are helping them by providing the, the appropriate uh, sacrifices that they need in order to go to the temple. We provide valuable services for those pilgrims and foreigners that come from hundreds and hundreds of miles. I mean, okay, yeah, I'm not perfect. I mean, I can tell the people that, you know, like they don't know how to count or they don't know if they get the right change back. And so, yeah, maybe I shortchange them from time to time. But, you know, I don't cheat them half as bad as the other money changers do. I mean, it's just, it's just how business is done. That's, I mean, everyone's doing it. That's just how it is. I mean, you can back me up, right? A little fudge there, a little creative financing here, you know, look the other way or, or get a few answers to the test. You know, I mean, nothing big, just a little, you know, adjusting your tax figures or, you know, don't tell the cashier when they give you too much change. I mean, it's their fault anyway. They gave you the wrong change, right? Everyone does it. What's the big deal? I just don't see why that stranger was so unbelievably upset. It happens on a Friday. Good Friday. God's Friday. Here now, Mark chapter 15. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, 
Lama Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, the when, now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked him for the body of, Christ, of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him, whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. As a centurion, commander in the Roman legion, I hold a very powerful, prestigious position. I'm in charge of a lot of men. I have a lot of responsibility and authority, which is why I was surprised on that Friday that they would want me to oversee a common execution. But I began to realize this was no common execution. This man named Jesus had quite a following. They were afraid of an uprising, so they asked me, to oversee this execution, to make sure the soldiers did what they needed to do, to make sure that the peace was kept, that there were no riots or uprising. And I did just that. While there were three men in all to be killed that day, there was something different about this Jesus. He didn't beg for his life or talk incessantly about how innocent he was. He didn't uh, yell and scream at me because I was the enemy and represented the Roman government carrying out this execution. He didn't have that, that anger, that hatred, that bitterness that most men have on that cross. Crucifixions are pretty brutal. Eventually, you end up dying by suffocation because eventually your lungs collapse as you're hanging there. Usually takes days. I've actually seen up to a week before, before men die. But you know, these Jews take their religious holidays seriously, and Sabbath was going to start at sundown. So we had orders to make sure that all the men had died by 6 o'clock that night. And we were told around 3.30 or 4, if they hadn't died yet, we were to break their legs, which speeds up the process to make sure they would be gone by 6. But we didn't have to do that with this Jesus. So it was around 9 o'clock as most executions begin, that we started and drove the iron spikes through their wrists, hung them on their own crosses. Jesus had mumbled a few words to a woman who was nearby and to one of the guys on the cross. I think he even said a few words at me, something about forgiveness, but I didn't catch it. I was busy making sure everything was in order according to protocol. I saw him, heard him, breathe his last. It was around 3 o'clock or so. But it was, it was kind of eerie. 
around noon is when there's these clouds came. I can't explain it, but it, it was like everything became dark for three hours until he breathed his last. I've never seen anything like it before. You could see in his eyes. It was almost like if I believed in God, it was almost like God had mercy on him. I haven't seen anyone die in just six hours before. I haven't seen all of creation respond to one man's agony before. And all I could think was truly, truly this man is God's son. There was something different about him. Even Pilate couldn't believe that this Jesus had died in only six hours. He sent for me to verify, to bear witness to the fact that, yes, Jesus was dead, and I told him the truth. It was all as he had heard. And then his body was released to some rabbi named Joseph. Now, I'm not religious, but that day I was touched because I, I witnessed a man who was more than a man. He was God's son. I've never seen anybody die like that. And I don't know how he lived his life, but I can tell you by the way he died. Truly, he was God's son. We turn now to our final scripture reading, which is from the Gospel of Luke that describes what happened after Jesus' death. Hear now God's word to us. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My name is Joseph. I'm from Arimathea. I am a member of the Sanhedrin Council, although I don't agree with all of their decisions. I am waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God to come, and I am a follower of Jesus, but I have to be careful who I share that with because, well, I am a member of the Sanhedrin and all. Jesus didn't deserve to die. I knew it wasn't the right decision. But it seemed like everyone had made their mind even before the council began, and I didn't want to be the lone dissenter, so I went along even though I did not agree with their plan or their action. But then I found out that Jesus' body was just going to be left there on that cross, on that hill like like a common criminal, and I couldn't let that happen. I had to do something. Perhaps it was out of guilt more than anything else. I felt somewhat responsible for this decision to send Jesus to Pilate. But in any case, 
I couldn't let Jesus' body just lay there. So today is Saturday on the Sabbath, and in our Jewish tradition, this is a day to rest. We can do no work, and we are to worship God, following God's commandments. Sabbath actually begins at sundown the night before yesterday, which was around 6 o'clock, and Jesus died around 3, so I knew we only had three precious hours to do what needed to be done. I went to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Being a member of the Sanhedrin Council, I did have a little sway with Pilate, and so after he had confirmed that Jesus was dead. He let me have that body. All I had was a linen cloth, given the hurried circumstances, to wrap that body in. And then I put it in the tomb. It was supposed to be my tomb. But Jesus needed it at the time. There were some women that were supposed to rub the, the traditional ceremonial ointments and spices on Jesus' body, but there just wasn't enough time to do it on Friday. So I made sure these women knew exactly where the tomb was, and when the Sabbath was over on Sunday morning, they could go and do what needed to be done. I had a few people help me roll that huge stone across the tomb, and we made it just in time, just before sundown. I'll just buy another tomb. I don't need it right now. Jesus needed it. It's not much, but, but at least it'll keep the animals away from his body. It's not much, but it's what he needed at the time. And all I can do now is pray and wait on this Sabbath day. I pray. I pray for God's kingdom to come, even though I don't know what that will look like and I don't know when it will happen. I pray. Because I have a lot of unanswered questions about Jesus and about faith and about God and about the scriptures. And I don't know if I'm the only one or not. Do you ever have questions? Questions about why things happen in life? Questions about faith or God or, or a purpose or a plan? Well, if you do, join me. Join me in praying and in waiting. Because my people know that God is faithful. That God will hear our prayers. That God will answer them in God's own time, in God's own way. God will provide an answer someday. Who knows? Maybe even tomorrow.